So this morning um, I was going to talk about, first of all, start with asking a question. Does, do people know what the next full moon will be? It's on, the, on Tuesday the 14th, this Tuesday coming, there'll be the full moon for those that haven't, haven't, that haven't noticed it in the sky. And when you live in a city, you don't notice it so much. When you live in the forest, of course, you notice you're very aware of the moon. So does anybody know what the next full moon commemorates? Did I hear? Poson. Poson, yes, of course. And uh, for, for those that are not Sri Lankan, of course, Poson. <laughs> they think, what is this, Poson? We've heard of Vesak last month, of course, with the Vesak uh, commemoration. That's the full moon in May when the Buddha uh, was uh, born, when he uh, attained awakening, and when he passed away, Parinibbana. But in June is a very significant uh, date in Buddhism because it is, as uh, people said, the full moon that marks the arrival of Buddhism in Sri Lanka. And that was um, quite a while ago, <laughs> to, around 247 BC. There's a bit of debate, 247 to 243 BC, give or take a few years. That's quite a long time ago that it arrived. And it arrived in a place called Mihintale, um, and uh, that's not far from the cap uh, what was the capital then, Anurandapura at that time. And uh, it's a very significant um, occasion in Sri Lanka, and I'll talk about the significance for the rest of the world too <laughs> in a minute, because people think, hang on, this is for Sri Lanka, isn't it? But it isn't, it's for the whole world actually. And uh, just to give you an idea of how important it is, at uh, Anuradhapura in Sri Lanka, at Mihintale, the mountain, not about 12 or 13 kilometers from Anuradhapura, you get about two million people coming to celebrate this full moon. And the stupa there, the Ruen Valley Sire, is covered in lights and surrounded by a sea of people. And it's really a very, very beautiful moving occasion. And because of drones, we can really appreciate it. <laughs> you can zoom in all around and it looks absolutely fantastic. So it's a very big occasion. And of course, it's not the only place. It's celebrated throughout Sri Lanka too. And they call it, I think it's called Mili, Mihindu uh, Paraheras they have, these processions, parades, um, where they celebrate this occasion because it's a very significant uh, occasion for Sri Lanka. And also, as I mentioned, some people may think, well, what about the rest of the world? You know, you know, is the arrival of Buddhism in Sri Lanka, is that significant for us? It's incredibly significant for Theravada Buddhism in particular, because if it hadn't happened that Buddhism went to Sri Lanka, we would probably have very little or very incomplete uh, sets of the teachings of the Buddha in Pali. We would be like one of the old, old, the original schools or the early schools of Buddhism. We have, you know, a smattering of their teachings, the written teachings uh, available these days. And it would have been a similar thing if uh, Venerable Mahinda hadn't come to Sri Lanka and bought, officially bought Buddhism to Sri Lanka. But because he came, of course, the teachings were preserved. And uh, as I mentioned, they, what really preserved them too was writing them down. Unbelievable for this generation, also for myself, <laughs> is they used to remember the teachings. Isn't that extraordinary? It really is quite amazing that they had it all by heart, as we say, in their memories. And, uh, but in around 80 BC, 80 to 70 BC, there was a big famine in Sri Lanka. And so the monks were responsible for remembering, and the nuns, remembering the teachings. And they would take, uh, like a group of monks would take one particular section of the teachings. We call them the Nikayas, you know, like the middle length discourses. And so that whole group of monks would uh, recite it and they would recite it to each other so they could keep it in mind, keep it, remember it, remember it. But because of the famine, some of the monks, well, many monks were dying, many nuns were dying, and some of the teachings were getting, only one person still remembered it. So they thought, hang on, we've got to write it down. <laughs> and that's why they did, in about 80 BC, they wrote it down. And 
to the credit of Sri Lanka, it's been kept, preserved since that time. And it's not only for Sri Lanka, it's for the whole world, actually, because we wouldn't have those original teachings in such a complete set as we do, in a complete um, uh, collection. So it's, very, it's a gift that uh, Sri Lanka gave to us. And I'd like to say, too, at this time, because Sri Lanka's going through a very, very hard time <laughs> economically and things are difficult with fuel, and difficult with food, some food items, and uh, a lot of things have become very, very difficult in Sri Lanka at the moment. And it's at times like this we should remember that the greatest treasure that Sri Lanka has is not the material wealth. It's good to have, it's comfortable, it makes life easy physically, but what they gave, uh, what they have is that teaching, the spiritual treasure of the Buddha, the teachings of the Buddha. And these are so valuable in trying times, difficult times, troubling times, because it helps us understand reality. You know, otherwise we can, we can get very distressed. We can get carried away by these things. But once we see it in terms of the Buddha's teaching, it helps us accept very difficult situations in a much better way, actually, and to make them part of our, our practice as well. Because we often people think, well, dumb is in the books, isn't it? it well, there is. But life is, is dumber, really. Our lives are dumber. And understanding our lives is really the practice of dumber. And that's what the Buddha's teaching is about, understanding our lives and giving us tools to look at uh, our lives in a way that we can really penetrate deeply, understand them, and develop happiness in the process as well. So very, uh, very significant that the uh, Venerable Mahinda, that was the name of the monk, who came from India with, I think, five other companions. And uh, as I said, that was about 247 BC, or give or take a few years. <laughs> And he met the king at that time, the king Deva Nampiatissa, who was hunting, which is a bit of a no-no for a Buddhist, but he's not a Buddhist yet. <laughs> and uh, just to mention that Venerable Mahinda, he has credentials, and uh, I'm sure part of those credentials actually made it easier for him to meet the king, actually, because he was the son, they say, of the Emperor Asoka. So that would, you know, that would have been a very significant uh, meeting, you know, the, from, uh, from one king's son to another king. So it was sort of probably a diplomatic mission as well. And at that uh, meeting, of course, you know, he, the Buddhism became established as more or less the official religion of the king and hence quite a lot of the country. Many historians will say that Buddhism probably had arrived in Sri Lanka before that, but very, very piecemeal probably, you know, bits and pieces, because Sri Lanka was connected to India, <laughs> and that's not that far away, so they would have heard of it. But when the king heard this teaching, that made a very big difference because he was very impressed and became a Buddhist. And his nephew, uh, who was, I don't know if he was a prince, Prince Arita, he became the first uh, Sri Lankan man to be ordained, and he became a bhikkhu. And I think he later became an arahant as well. Not only did Mahinda bring the Dhamma to Sri Lanka, he also invited some years later, it wasn't <laughs> straight after, some years later, invited his sister, who I think many people here will know, uh, Venerable Sangamita. And here in the BSV, we used to have a residence for bhikkhunis, and it was called Sangamita uh, Bhikkhuni Residence, uh, Sangamita. And she came and she established the bhikkhuni order in Sri Lanka, which flourished for over about a thousand years, actually. Not only did she bring, uh, did she establish the bhikkhuni order, she also bought very practically, she bought a, a, a section of the Bodhi tree that the Buddha was enlightened under. They, sometimes they say a sapling, sometimes they say a cutting from one of the branches. So she brought that to Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka as well. And very interestingly, I think uh, uh, Venerable Mahinda was quite a, um, I think, interesting teacher because 
he didn't start immediately teaching the king. He first thought, I will test the king. You know, his uh, ability to understand the Dhamma and, uh, and also really, I think, to gauge his interest as well. So in order to do that, he gave him this quiz. Interesting, isn't it? You meet, meet a king and then you give him a quiz. Very interesting, actually. So I thought I'd try an experiment today and see how you respond to the quiz. But only one, one provision. Those who have heard the answer before shouldn't, put, you know, shouldn't respond because you already know the answer. You may have forgotten it, actually, but when you hear the, the quiz, it will come back to you. So, first of all, he said, uh, when Mahinda said to the king, what is this tree, your majesty? And he said, it's a mango tree. And I think uh, the king probably thought, my goodness, doesn't he know mango trees? <laughs> but then he continued and he says, are there any other mango trees besides this mango tree? And the king said, well, of course there are, you know, yes, yes. And then the king said, besides this mango tree and the other mango trees, are there other types of trees? And the king said, yes, of course, many, many other types of trees. And then the king asked, well, besides these other mango trees, these other trees of different types, are there any other trees? Now, those that don't know the answer, haven't heard this before, haven't heard it before, it's probably easier, what would your answer be? Tree? Any? Anyone else? Actually, you're pretty, it's pretty spot on what you're saying because I think uh, that's what most people would think. Anyone got another answer? Besides the other mango trees and the other types of trees, is there any other tree that... Uh, any other trees? Wow. Ah, oh, yes, Claire. Oh, yeah, but that comes in other types of trees. But you know what the answer is? I think all the Sri Lankan people here probably remember it or coming back to them, actually. The answer is this mango tree. Because he was talking this mango tree, other mango trees, and other types of trees. So three groups of trees, really. And when he... It's a trick question. Because then he says... Other mango trees, are there any other trees, but other mango trees, uh, besides the other mango trees, the other trees, are there any other trees? And of course, the answer is this mango tree, <laughs> the one that he started with. So it was a bit of a trick question. But what it demonstrates, I think, very clearly, and I think this is um, part of it, was the fact that the king was interested. He was paying attention. He was engaged. But engaged is very important because... He could just be listening and, and not take it in at all and not have said, as he did say, this mango tree. So he got it right. Incredible, isn't it? And uh, Venerable Wapola uh, Rahula, who's a famous uh, uh, Sri Lankan monk who wrote a history book, actually. And in that, he says, this was the first recorded intelligence test. <laughs> I don't know whether you say it's an intelligence test, but anyway, certainly there's a little bit of logic or deduction. But the main point, I think, is that you pay, one pays attention. And it reminds me of when the Buddha gave any teaching, he would always say to the listeners, you know, uh, please pay attention, careful attention to what I'm about to say, because obviously, you know, our minds can drift. And uh, to actually get value out of what somebody says, particularly a Buddha, to pay attention is very important. It's quite, there's a translation of Yoniso Manasikara, and it's careful attention. It's got a slightly different meaning, but it does take us to wisdom if we can actually see into things. But by paying attention, we have that possibility of seeing into things. The next question is, what would have happened if the king had got it wrong? <laughs> Would Mahinda, then will Mahinda have packed his bags and gone back to it? <laughs> forget it, forget it, no good. <laughs> no, I wonder what he would have done in that case. We don't know. But he gave, uh, so the next one, of course, is what was the teaching that the Venerable Mahinda did give? 
the, uh, the king, Deva Nampiatissa. What did he teach him? Do you remember? All the Sri Lankans should know it. Do you know it, Sabitu? It's called, in Pali, it's called the Chula Hati Padoma Sutta. So, uh, usually say sutra in, in uh, Sri Lanka. But it's a shorter teaching on the simile of the elephant's footprint. And this is where I mentioned if, uh, well, you're not seeing the live chat, but those that see the uh, live chat on the YouTube, you can see the link for this sutta in the, the Sutta Central. And it has the, 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 the link for that. You can go to either Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation or Ajahn Sajato's translation. There's also another translation there, but much, much earlier. So Sutta Central is a very, very useful source of information. And I, I say to people, whenever you get confused about different teachers' um, teachings of the Buddha's uh, original teachings, go to the suttas and check them out. Because sometimes people, you know, teachers do make mistakes. And so it's very useful to check up by reading it. And the great beauty of Sutta Central, doing an ad here, is that it has translations, not only in English, but it has the Pali, Pali, has the English translations, and it has many other languages, including Sinhala. It's the uh, Sosia so uh, so translation, the Soisa translation, which is quite old, but it's in Sinhala there. So many, many different translations in many different languages, so very useful. And also for those that are really interested too, in, yes, in March, April, uh, end of March, beginning of April, Ajahn Brahmali was here, and he taught this very sutta over eight days. So if you really want detail. <laughs> but he expanded on some of the different uh, sections of this sutta, because it's called the gradual training. The sutta is a very, very practical teaching, actually. But I also put the, uh, I think Langdon has put the, <laughs> the link for that, uh, for the podcast, the, the audio recordings of that retreat. And I can really encourage you to listen to it. It was incredibly inspiring, and some of the, the sessions very moving, actually. So uh, it was a very good explanation. So this sutta, the, uh, on the elephant's footprint, the simile of the elephant's footprint, is called a gradual training. And you'll see why. It's a progressive training and called Anupuba Sika. Sika is training. And it appears in many different spots in the, uh, um, the Pali Canon, in the teachings of the Buddha, the early teachings of the Buddha. And so it's a, it is something that is very useful, very practical. Um, it's, I, I sort of reflect, why did, and I'll get on to this, and why did Venerable Mahinda give this teaching? But it is incredibly practical. It's showing us how we, starting from the beginning of the path, how we can follow through to the, to the end of the path, to check up, is the Buddha really awakened? To check up if the teachings are well expounded, to check up if the Sangha is practicing well. So that's the aim of this, this sutta, actually. And it's gradual in the sense that the Buddha, because sometimes we have this um, debate, is it gradual awakening or sudden awakening? Do you hear this all the time? But I think it's a bit of both, personally. But <laughs> what the Buddha said was, I don't say that enlightenment is achieved right away. Rather, enlightenment is achieved by gradual training, gradual progress, and gradual practice. But when it happens, I think it's pretty swift. <laughs> Getting up to that point is probably a little bit slower and very gradual. But one of the similes they often use for that, the gradualness of our practice, and this is good for all of us to remember because we can get disheartened. We think, well, I've been practicing for years. <laughs> Where have I got, you know, how have I progressed on the Noble Eightfold Path? And the Buddha uses a simile of a tool that one uses very frequently and has, say, a wooden handle. And we use it every day. You don't see how much you've worn the wooden handle away. But after a long time, you see, oh, worn away quite a bit of the, the, the handle of this tool. And in the same way, when we practice more consistently over years and years and years, 
we are wearing away our defilements, wearing away the things that stop us from becoming awake and stop us from developing deep inner happiness and deep inner peace. So it's these defilements really that are the problem. Once they're out of the way, once they're dealt with, then we can start to see things clearly, see things differently. And uh, this is what the, why this teaching, gradual training, is, quite, is very important. And it's also gradual, as I mentioned, because it's a chain of cause and effect. You need all the different parts of this chain in order to reach the end. So, and uh, it's also, when we see the gradual training, as you'll hear in a minute, it doesn't sound like the Noble Eightfold Path, but it is. And uh, that was one of the things that I found very interesting with Ajahn Brahmali's retreat, how he related it to the Noble Eightfold Path. Because the Noble Eightfold Path is a very um, conceptual way of thinking of the Buddha's teachings. But this way, the, the way, the gradual training, it's actually very practical, hands-on <laughs> a way of uh, practicing the teachings. So it's a, it is a, a very useful one for all of us because we can check up in our practice if it's not going well or if there are difficulties. Which aspect of this gradual training am I uh, lacking or I need to focus on for more development to, development to occur? And of course, uh, as I mentioned, we, one of the reasons why uh, the um, Venerable Mahinda was teaching this, I think, is because it was teaching non-Buddhists. They, they weren't Buddhists. And so he wasn't asking them to believe in a lot. He wasn't giving them a lot of teaching about uh, the Noble Eightfold Path and about right view and all these things. He was giving them the practical uh, chain of um, events that can lead to realizing for ourselves that these teachings are true, these teachings are useful. So it's a, it's a way of us checking for a person to check up if the Buddha was awakened, that the teachings are well expounded and also that the Sangha is practicing well. And of course this is one of the... The, the Buddha is the most remarkable teacher, spiritual teacher, I think, in, in the, by far, because he actually ta uh, he invites us to investigate himself and his teachings. You know, is he really enlightened? And there's a sutta in the uh, middle length discourses where, called the investigator, um, where he says the last way we can check up if the Buddha is enlightened is by practicing what he teaches and to see for ourselves if it leads to the results he says it should lead to. And that is what this whole sutta is about practicing what the Buddha is uh, uh, teaching in order to see if it does bring one to awakening, does bring one to enlightenment. And by the, doing that, of course, we, we realize for ourselves, yes, it works. Yes, the Buddha was awakened. Yes, the, the teachings are, the Dhamma is a reflection of reality, is a description of reality, and the Sangha, there are those that have practiced it and awaken too. So a very, a very um, uh, you know, a practical teaching, very practical, quite, quite down to earth. So it's a, an interesting suit. I'll just give a little bit of the background, which uh, it, because the, uh, the, the background I think is quite funny in a way. It's, <laughs> it's quite amusing because it uh, starts with this Brahman Janasoni. And this Brahman Janasoni must have been a bit of a trendsetter, I think, because he had an all-white chariot, he wore all-white clothes, he had white horses, everything was white, and he would drive around the city, it says, the commentary says, every six months, displaying his magnificence and prosperity, strewing it around. So he encounters a person who's just met the Buddha, and, he, uh, and this person, um, a wanderer called Pilotika, um, and he talk about the Buddha and, and uh, this wanderer, this person who's just met the Buddha, is so impressed that uh, uh, the Brahmin Janasoni asks him, well, what, why are you so impressed, you know? And then he says, well, it's like, and then he gives the, the simile of the elephant's footprint. Guess who the elephant is? <laughs> Do you know who the elephant is? 
the Naga. This is it's really the Buddha, actually. This is the whole focus of the, this simile, is really the Buddha or a spiritual teacher. But he gives this example. He says for him, the elephant's footprint, when a skilled person who knows elephant footprints can go into the forest and they see the elephant's, this big elephant's footprint, and then they say, oh, yes, this must be, you know, a really big bull elephant. This is like the leader of the elephants. And from that, um, you can assume that this is, is the real McCoy. This is the big bull elephant somewhere down the track. You've seen the footprints, so you know it. And he says for him, the reason he says that is because there are aristocrats, there are uh, householders, and there are uh, aesthetics, Brahmins and ascetics that go and see the Buddha. And they are going there to debate, to defeat him, and, uh, you know, uh, demolish his teaching. And instead, the Buddha gives them a teaching and says, encourages them, educates them, fires them up and inspires them. They end up becoming his disciples. <laughs> and the same with the ascetics. But the interesting thing for Palotika, he says with the ascetics, these are spiritual people that have given up, you know, the household life, we say, and uh, practising a spiritual teaching. They ask to ordain. And having ordained, they realise the fruit of that practice the, of the, the Buddha's teaching. They become awakened themselves. And so he says, because of these four footprints, the uh, aristocrats, uh, the uh, Brahmins, and also the householders, these are wealthy people really, business people usually, and because of the aesthetics, these are the four footprints for him. And so... The Brahmin Janus are very impressed, very impressed. and gets quite excited and, uh, and then pays homage to in the direction of where he thinks the Buddha is <laughs> with the Namo Tassa. So it's quite, 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 it's sort of a, it's a, um, what do you say, a dramatic setting for the, the Sutta. So he's, um, so this is the background to it. And of course then he goes and sees the Buddha and asks him, he tells him, well, I met this person who just met you. And he, he, he said, he gave this simile of the, the elephant's footprints, and he said, for these reasons, he's, he's very impressed with the Buddha. One thing I did wonder is, if Pilotika, who was a wanderer, he's like an ascetic, was so impressed, why didn't he ordain? <laughs> he's very impressed in the, in the sutta. Why didn't he ordain? And then the Buddha says, well, of course, yes. He said, that's not the complete uh, uh, the complete simile of the elephant's footprint. He, he takes over that uh, idea of the elephant's footprint and he gives that, he said, I'll give that in detail, the, the complete uh, teaching about the elephant's footprint. Now, it's, uh, the interesting thing with an elephant's footprint is that it's the largest, probably, footprint you can get. So all other animals fit into that footprint. So it's a similar idea that all the Dhamma fits into the Four Noble Truths, for instance. So everything fits into it. And also the idea of the elephant, as I mentioned. The Buddha is often represented as a naga, and this is a, like a great spiritual being, but also as an elephant, a leader of the elephants. So it's one of the things that uh, uh, the Buddha is uh, you know, referred to as a naga. But he says... If somebody was really skilled uh, um, elephant tracker, they would not come to the conclusion that this was a big bull elephant just from a footprint. He said there's lots of other elephants that can make big footprints. <laughs> and uh, he says that they, uh, they wouldn't, a skilled tracker wouldn't come to that conclusion. And uh, they would build up evidence for coming to a conclusion. Um, so it's he, he is using that simile to, to show, the, show um, Janasoni that it's very important that we investigate our teachers. We're very important that we investigate. We don't just believe. Uh, we see the elephant's footprint. We hear someone's teaching and think, wow, that's really impressive. We investigate it. And, uh, and particularly, as you see in terms of the sutta, we practice what they teach and see if it does actually deliver what they, they say it does. So 
This is one of the one of the things with this sutta that is very very this teaching is that that emphasis on checking up and uh, and investigating is really so strong because because they were non Buddhists, but it's also a very strong aspect of the Buddha's teaching, because he says that a, a skilled elephant tracker would not come to the conclusion would not assume. They'd say there was a bull elephant in the forest until they actually saw that elephant. And that's like when we practice the teachings, we experience it for ourselves. It's not just through the books, it's our own direct experience. And this is what he is, he is driving uh, the whole teaching t toward, that we must see it for ourselves. You must actually see this elephant not just assume from seeing the footprints and seeing tusk masks, uh, tusk marks on the trees and broken branches that this is a big bull elephant. So then he gives the gradual training. And of course, I'll just go through that. So this is actually the training that's very useful for us in terms of developing our meditation practice because it's very focused on um, developing the deep meditations and then the deep insights. And it's, uh, as I mentioned before, it's the causal process. So you need one factor to lead to the next before you can really, uh, they, they lead on. It's a progressive, it's a gradual uh, way of practice. And of course, as I mentioned, it's the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path too. So we'll see that when we go in, into the teaching. And of course, where it all begins, as you naturally assume, is the arising of a Buddha. <laughs> That's the beginning of the, the uh, gradual training. And so he, the Buddha talks about the arising of a Buddha. And the, the arising of a Buddha is somebody that has seen directly, through their own experience, reality. They've seen this world and the other world. That's how they put it in the text, this world and the other world. And they have seen it very deeply. And it's quite interesting, and Ajahn Brahmani said this, that the arising of a Buddha is a natural consequence. From time to time, there will be those, given the right conditions, the, the right uh, faculties, you might say, that will see reality in its depth. But they will need you know, purity of mind. They'll need good uh, morality. They will need deep meditation and then to reflect. But this will happen, but it doesn't happen that often. <laughs> so the rising of the Buddha is very, very rare. And the qualities of the Buddha that he is the, uh, like the supreme teacher of uh, beings who wish to be, or the su supreme guide of be beings that wish to be tra uh, trained. Um, and I think it, it brings up the question, what about other teachers? You know, our, uh, the teachers that we, like myself, like Ajahn Brahm and so on. And I think for all of us, the Buddha has to be our teacher. The, the, he is the teacher, you say, really. And all the other teachers are, as I call them in Go the Goenka tradition, assistant teachers. I quite like that idea. <laughs> I don't know whether they would like that, but it's true. We're, we're expounding, we're following the Buddha's path. He is the teacher. So if we're ever in any doubt, go back to the teacher. And that's why I was mentioning Sutta Central before. It's so important to do that. And also, it's very important that we can connect with the Buddha. We have some sort of faith in the Buddha. And this is why we have Buddha Nusati, recollection of the Buddha. We just did it. We just did that recollection there. Because in the end, it's what faith, faith is what drives our practice. And it's an emotion. It's not a dry, intellectual, um, conceptual type of a, a reflection. It's one that brings up emotion. And that is what will actually get us to practice, actually. If we think, yeah, it's quite a good description of reality. You know, it matches with what I experience myself. Then we will feel, yeah, this, this could lead me to um, understanding myself, understanding the body, this body and mind, and understanding the world. So this is a very important thing that uh, the, uh, we are driven by emotions, and this faith act is one of those emotions. It's an activating emotion. And of course, the Buddha um, is 
the, t- the uh, taught because the Buddha arises, then he teaches the Dhamma. Uh, Sama Sambuddha, a perfectly awakened Buddha, teaches the Dhamma. So it's a causal effect as well, actually. And he says in this sutta that it's good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. So it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. And you don't have to wait either, because it's from the beginning as well. So, and uh, in that, when he reflects on the Dhamma, because when a Buddha arises, he teaches the Dhamma, he teaches a Dhamma that is has a spiritual, uh, reveals a spiritual practice. And that's really important. It's not just a philosophy, because there's lots of philosophies in the world, but they don't give, they don't have a, a path of practice. How do you put them into uh, practice? A lot of philosophies can affect the way we think, but when we have a path of practice, that's how we can develop um, that understanding further and further, so it becomes our own. And so, This is an important aspect of it, that it's a spiritual practice that he's given us, the Noble Eightfold Path, and also this practice on the uh, gradual training. And having heard that teaching, of course, if we resonate with it, faith will come up, and then we will uh, wish to uh, act on that faith. And in this sutta, it is then a person will want to ordain. Of course, that's... uh, um, that's the classic or ide- idyllic, ide- idealised uh, uh, part of the uh, response of faith to want to ordain is a very common one. And so this faith is so important for activating what we call the five indriyas. It's the first one. When we have as faith or confidence, some people like conviction, then we'll have energy, (laughs) then we'll have energy, and then we'll want to apply that energy. And that's where it leads to mindfulness, because we apply it through our mindfulness by uh, practicing the five precepts. You need mindfulness, (laughs) we practice generosity, and we practice meditation. And then from that mindfulness, it can lead to deeper, deeper stillness in the mind, samadhi. The mind coming together, finding inner happiness, really, and getting this incredible power as with, of the mind, this incredible ability to look into things and then to develop wisdom. So this is the importance of uh, faith, uh, hearing the teachings and faith coming up. And the sorts of things that we hear in a teaching have to resonate with us. They have to connect in order for faith to come up, in order for someone to wish to ordain, for instance. And uh, I, I always like um, the venerable, uh, the uh, Ratapala Sutta. This is uh, a person who ordained after hearing a teaching, wanted to ordain after hearing a teaching of the Buddha. His parents said, no, you can't ordain. And so he went on a hunger strike. <laughs> and then his parents realised, because his friend said to him, well, if, if he dies of hunger, you'll lose him anyway. Why not let him ordain? And he may change his mind later. And so they allow him to ordain. But the reason he wanted to ordain was he heard four summaries. And this is what he heard. The world is unstable and swept away. The world has no shelter and no saviour. The world has no owner. You must leave it all behind and pass on. The world is wanting, insatiable, the slave of craving. And that was enough for him to want to ordain. And he says, knowing and seeing uh, seeing and, and hearing these four summaries, he wanted to ordain. Knowing and seeing often, often suggests a breakthrough, actually, to the first, probably the first level of... Uh, awakening. So perhaps that was enough for him. So it's good to reflect on what inspired all of you to practice the Buddhist teaching or be interested in the Buddhist teaching. And I think that's something that is good to keep in mind. For a person who ordains, that's always something good to remember. Why did we want to ordain? But also for all Buddhists, you know, just to reflect on what really did we connect with? because that can be very helpful in difficult times. We can just remember, yeah, that's why I wanted to practice this path. That's what interested me in practicing this path. So that's quite good. That's a, and then uh, having um, developed this faith, then of course want to put it into 
that develop this faith that leads to energy, virya. We want to put it into practice, and then we practice morality. So this morning, we took the five precepts, and in this sutta, the, uh, the Buddha gives like the ten precepts plus. There's extra ones as well. So they are important um, foundation for our practice. You know, sometimes we think with meditation, well, you know, meditation's an important thing, you know, the dana and the, uh, the, the giving and sharing, not so important, uh, the, the morality, not so important, just the meditation. But this is one of the vital supports. And if we're having difficulty with our meditation, first thing most teachers will say, check up <laughs> on morality. And it's not only the morality of, of uh, keeping the precepts, according to the letter of the precepts, it's to the spirit too. It's not only to the level of restraint, you know, I won't kill living beings, I won't steal, I won't have sexual misconduct, etc. Um, it's also to the level of, a positive level of, no, I will, I'll have compassion for beings, I'll help them, I'll give, you know, I will be reliable, I will be dependable, I'll be truthful. And I'll be clear mind. I won't be muddled with alcohol and drugs. So it's, it's though the mental level that it's actually very important. This is where we practice uh, right intention. This is the aspect of right intention. When we have this uh, intention of loving kindness, kindness, compassion, and harmlessness. We don't want to harm other people. Don't want to harm ourselves. So this morality is a vital uh, aspect of the path, not optional, <laughs> isn't this gradual training? And then it, uh, it leads on to the Buddha mentions next contentment, and he's talking about contentment for uh, a monk or a nun, which is in the ideal ideal setting would be just with a robe and alms food. That's enough. Well, really, it is, <laughs> but there's a good deal more most of us uh, need, and often we think of the four requisites, don't we? So we have clothes. We have food, we have medicines, and a place to stay. They're pretty, pretty important. But if we, if we are content with them, it means that we're not always spending a lot of our mind thinking, well, I need to upgrade to the next, a bigger home, a, a bigger car, or a bigger whatever. You know, so this contentment is incredibly important. It's the opposite of the way the world operates. You know, if you look at the world, it's always saying to you, you need this, you must have that. You know, it's not that expensive. <laughs> you know, it's really encouraging us to want more, not to, to simplify our lives, not to be content with what we have. Often if we actually look at what we have in our lives, we think, yeah, it's really quite okay, really. But when we have these desires, when we have wanting in the mind, those become so big that it obscures. We can't see what we already have and that, that it's enough, it's good. So this contentment, very important part uh, of the path, and it leads to a happiness, the Buddha says in this sutta. And uh, due to this practice of virtue and contentment, we, we can experience the delightful bliss of the joy of blamelessness, they call it, blamelessness. So being a good person, the happiness and joy of being a good person. It's called the Anavaja Sukha in, by the Buddha. And then the next aspect of it is the restraint of the senses. This is so important in our lives and, and in the 21st century with the internet. <laughs> restraint is of the senses is so important. And what this is, is means that through the, particularly through the five senses, that we don't get carried away, don't get caught up with what we see, hear, smell, taste and touch. That so that it doesn't create this sort of uh, clinging to things that we think are happiness that, uh, uh, and holding on to things that really stop us from just letting, experiencing things and moving on. Often we're attaching to all those nice sights, smells, tastes, touches and so on. And instead of just experiencing them and letting them be. And when we, when we attach to them, of course, it's going to cause, what does it cause? It either causes more wanting <laughs> or we want to get rid of something, you know, aversion. So these are negative, these are defilements that really, really um, 
They stir up the mind. They make the mind unclear. They reduce the power. They reduce the purity of the mind, the strength of the mind. And so if we restrain the senses, if we reflect, we use the power of reflection to the... Uh, there's a nice teaching, Ajahn Brahmali's retreat, on the two powers. And one of them is the power of reflection and one is the power of development. But the power of reflection is just the simple reflection. You know, is this uh, thought, is this action, is this speech unwholesome? Is it leading to a painful result or not? And also the converse, is this, lead, this a positive, something positive, a positive thought, a positive action or positive speech, and is it leading to good results? Just that reflection is enough for us to restrain. And uh, as I say, it's so, so important with the internet because the seeing and hearing there is very strong for us. And you can just see it. You know, you read some news or, you, or, or whatever, see a video or see a uh, movie or whatever, it is, and the reactions that can come up, you just think, wow, it's just incredible. And really, in reality, it's just an image. It's just an image with sound, and that's it. But uh, it, the reverberations, it destabilizes the mind, and therefore it's a, um, it, it, is very, it, it impairs, it's an obstacle to the meditation becoming uh, more still, more deep, and also developing wisdom. So we practice to l not allow these things to stick in the mind, and to let go of them. I better move on, because now is the time to finish, actually. <laughs> but this is an important one. Restraint is really, really important. And really, we get pulled around by what we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch, and what we think about these things. We just get pulled around. And so when we can get some freedom from that, that is not a small thing. And uh, the ability to say no is something that is quite wonderful if we can do that. Just to get that happiness from being able to say, no, I'm not going to go there <laughs> and enjoy it, not think I'm missing out on whatever it is. So, and the Buddha mentions that when we, when we, uh, when we practice sense restraint, we, ex we experience an even more delightful bliss. And it's the joy of being unagitated of the joy of not being pulled around by what we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. And I call it the joy of freedom from these things too. And then the Buddha talks, just to just mention this briefly, from that sense restraint, he goes to what uh, Sati Sampajanya. So this is the, uh, Sujata calls it situational awareness. We know what's going on in, in the present moment. Uh, we know um, why we're doing something. We know the purpose of it. We know what's suitable for achieving that purpose. And we know if this is something within the scope of Dhamma, is this wholesome, unwholesome or not. And we also know, uh, keep in mind, the fact that this is not, uh, what we experience is not a personal thing. It's a process that's happening. So that's the part of the... Uh, Situational awareness, sometimes called full awareness, clear comprehension, very important. It's a part of sense restraint too, because uh, we are aware of whether something's wholesome or not, and we can step back from it. And that leads into the meditation. All this, just preparation for the meditation. So if any aspect of your meditation is, is, you feel is not strong, Look at some of these factors, you know, whether it be virtue, whether it be contentment, sense restraint, and this situational awareness, that ability just to, to know what we're doing. Often we don't actually, we just do things, we're not realising what the purpose behind them is. So then a person uh, develops a meditation, they abandon the five hindrances, and this is a very, uh, a very important step because they are the things that block us from experiencing deep meditation and experiencing deep wisdom and deep peace. And having done that, then in this the Buddha, example, the Buddha says that person will go into jhana and they experience these deep meditations which are incredibly powerful, life-changing, and giving rise to the power and steadiness of the mind to see deeply. And then, of course, the person 
can experience insights. They may see, in this example, the Buddha gives in the gradual training, an important one, see their past lives. And then they see, having seen their past lives, they see also how beings pass away from one life and rise in the next life. And the mechanism for that being what they've done, what they've said, what they've thought in their previous lives. And each time the Buddha is mentioning, when he mentions the, the four jhanas, these are footprints of the Buddha. When he mentions uh, the insights, this is a footprint of the, the, the Buddha. Pre prior to that, they're not footprints. <laughs> so we're getting close. We're thinking, wow, this must be the, the, the big bull elephant. This must be the awakened one. He says, no, hang on, hang on, no. And then uh, having seen those two, then the person uh, sees the Four Noble Truths. They have all this data that they've got from their insight their past lives, the way beings pass on due to their actions. And reflecting on that, what do they see? They say, see, this is unsatisfactory. This is, it's never going to lead to complete happiness. And the cause for that is this wanting and this desire. And the ending of this uh, unsatisfactoriness, of course, letting go of that wanting and desire particularly the wanting and desire to be reborn again. And then the last aspect, seeing the path to, uh, to uh, developing that wisdom, that understanding, practicing that, the path of practice. Always comes back to the path of practice. And then that person, the Buddha says, they will abandon the defilements by thinking of the defilements, that uh, this defilement is dukkha, and this is the cause of this defilement. This is the ending of this defilement. This is the path leading to the end of this defilement. And the defilements the Buddha is talking about are big time defilements. <laughs> it's our attachment to sensual uh, experience, sensory experience, the happiness we get from it. It's our attachment to wanting to continue to exist. And it's our ignorance about the fact that none of this is permanent. None of this will be completely satisfying forever and ever. We change, the things change. And also that it's an impersonal process. And uh, having seen that, then the Buddha says, still one wouldn't conclude this is a big bull elephant. This footprint is, is actually the big bull elephant. He says they still would not have come to a conclusion, but they're coming to a conclusion. And, and then he continues, having seen that, uh, that, having understood, having seen that these defilements have finished, knowing and seeing that they've finished, then uh, they know that they understand. Birth is ended. The spiritual journey has been completed. What had to be done has been done, and there is no return to any state of existence. That, and then, then the Buddha said, this is another footprint. But, it says, at this point, a person can come to the conclusion, yes, the Blessed One is fully awakened, the teachings are well expounded, and the Sangha is practicing well, because they've just completed the path, they've gone the whole journey, they know for themselves. So I'd just like to conclude by encouraging everyone to practice the gradual training as much as we can in our lives. There's a very practical example I feel, that can give us some idea of where our practice need, we need to uh, focus our practice to, in order for the, pro, uh, the practice to progress, to bring happiness in this life, and eventually to bring the end of rebirth. That's the aim, eventually. So I'd like to finish there, and thank you very much for listening. I meant to finish about seven minutes ago, but nevertheless, that's <laughs> life. So, are there any questions from the floor? And then, sounds like Parliament. It's a great suitor, it really is. And
Maybe you can take one from online if there's any online and then we can... If people, oh, you've got a question? Yeah, would you like, do you want to speak from... If you if you like to come to the microphone, you're welcome. I know some people would be shy to, but... Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering about yeah. uh, how to overcome like doubt in practice. Mm. Mm. Like I've recently sort of started to develop a like a daily practice, but sometimes that faith gets broken, mm. and the mm. doubt seems to constantly be there, and it's like I'm pushing it away all the time. Right, right. Yeah, doubt is one of the five hindrances, isn't it? You know, and it's mentioned when we overcome the hindrances here. And of course, you know, the, the mention in this sutta is just knowing that uh, whether something is positive or negative, you know, and that way, um, you know, sort of being able to let it go, recognizing it for what, it, what, what effect it's having on us. Yeah. So in that context, but doubt can come in many shapes and uh, forms. You know, it can be doubt uh, about our own ability, for sure. You know, that can be something that undermines us. Um, and then to just to reflect that this is a process. You know, the Buddhist teaching, this meditation path is a process. And so if we practice, keep practicing, it will happen. It's just a, it hasn't happened yet. And then also the other aspect is that we may not be clear about the teachings. We may have doubt about the teachings or the meditation practice. That can be another one too. Am I doing it right? And that, that is really um, uh, derails us actually. Once you start to think, am I doing it right or am I doing it wrong? Then it really you know, throws things out of whack. So in order to uh, overcome it, it's very good to, you know, to read a little bit more and to develop the faith too is, is, is that reading can bring up faith too, or listen to teachings, you know, or teachers that you resonate with, you know, you have a connection. Some teachers you have a strong connection with, others not so much. And so if you, if you have that sort of connection, and also friends, you know, spiritual friends, that can really help. If there are a lot of other people that one's meditating with, if you do you meditate in a group? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, group is good. Because you can get real energy support from a group, actually. So I, I reckon that that's another good good way to to overcome this doubt. But always in the Buddha's teaching, it's knowing. You know, often the Buddha says, uh, "You know, I know you, Mara," and it's like knowing, knowing that. The, yep, this is this is Mara. This is a negative state of mind, and this is doubt. And doubt is not going, is a, is a negative. And some, that can help us let go of it, actually recognising it's not for our benefit and happiness yeah. and well-being. But uh, also developing our understanding is good, yeah. So cool. I hope that helps a bit. Yeah, <laughs> Thank definitely. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah. We usually try to alternate a question from the yeah. floor here with one from online. Yeah. I'll start with one that was asked actually on the Monday night last week, but we didn't have time to address it. Mm. And um, oh, yeah. the person has come back to ask it again. Good. Uh, how does a Buddhist deal with the threat of physical violence, mm -hmm. especially when de-escalating the situation or avoiding it altogether is not an option? Right. Wow, that's really... Uh a confronting sort of situation, yeah, de-escalating it and avoiding it not possible. Yeah. Uh, well, I, would, I would say, you know, just try to think, what would I do in that sort of situation? And I think uh, if one couldn't get away from it, you know, escape from it, um, there are a number of possibilities. One would have to defend oneself. Um, Maybe, I mean, it's easy to say, maybe even challenge the person. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? You know, um, something like that. Try and reflect, but not in, a, not in um, an accusative way. Try to do it so, you know, just to make them think, what are, why, why are they doing this? You know, so um, these would be some ways that I think one could deal with it. Uh, it, of course, when we defend ourselves, if possible, to avoid 
bringing up a lot of uh, hate or a negative ill will towards this person, pretty hard, because we have the simile of the, uh, um, the simile for the simile of the saw, where the Buddha mentions that if we, we were, our limbs were being sawed off by bandits, you know, arms and legs, sounds like Monty Python. <laughs> uh, um, you know, we were to develop a state of ill will, then we wouldn't be practicing his, practicing his teach. Who could do that? <laughs> now he's really giving the, you know, that's really the extreme example, you know, just to to show us, you know, that uh, if that this this uh, that whatever we experience is going to be minor compared to that. Most of us won't have our limbs sawed off, actually. But confronting violence is like this person is talking about, you know, threat to the physical threat is is, uh, is of a similar nature. But to look after their minds as much as possible in that situation, be kind to themselves, and uh, if they can escape, good. Um, and to, as I said, you know, to defend themselves in whatever way they can verbally is always a good option. Um, and, uh, you know, if they can escape, that's the best thing. You know, people will always ask, well, what, you know, <laughs> how can they defend themselves physically? Well, I don't know, maybe they, um, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure how they could do that. So, but the, one of the things that's very important for all of us is if we develop a lot more, if we develop a, a meta kindness a lot of the time in ourselves, it means, and this is one of the benefits the Buddha mentions actually, is that we um, are protected. We don't get into situations quite so much um, if we have got a lot of kindness in ourselves, in our minds, if we develop it a lot. Somehow we, we don't allow that dynamic to arise. So it's, uh, otherwise we, you know, if there's a lot of fear, where there's a lot of anger, it will feed into the other person in a very strong way. It will, it will encourage the violence, the fear will, so will anger and all that. It won't help. So if we have, have a practice of developing a metta, uh, kindness, loving kindness, uh, friendliness, then that, that will help protect us um, because we will, uh, to a certain extent, I think we... When you, when you develop a lot of metta, you have a certain, um, we say vibe, <laughs> that doesn't, doesn't encourage people to want to attack or uh, want to uh, be violent towards one. So I would, I would encourage that person to, to develop that because also it reduces our fear. And um, uh, if we can do that on a regular basis, you certainly can't do it when you're in the situation straight away. If you've done it before, if you've done it regularly, then you're prepared for it. And that is the best self-defense in a way. Yeah. So uh, that would be my suggestion in a way. Yes. Uh, are monks allowed to defend themselves physically? Uh, are monks allowed to defend themselves physically? Well, yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. We're not... We're not allowed to, we should try to avoid harming others, you know, and definitely, you know, uh, there are rules that we shouldn't hit another monk or, you know, <laughs> abuse other, verbally abuse and so forth. So uh, I think we would defend ourselves as best we could, you know. Um, for instance, you know, I think of, it, but to use wisdom power is the best. You know, like, I mean, for instance, in Sri Lanka, I go on arms around and dogs can be and uh, can be quite a bother because dogs are lovable on their own. Get, get them into a pack and they really, really become troublesome, to say the least. So I would often carry a bottle of water. And when the dogs got difficult, uh, then I would sprinkle water around, throw it towards them, and then they go off. I don't know if Australian dogs would do this, but Sri Lankan dogs hate water. <laughs> and uh, this became a problem for me because I had uh, this dog, that, uh, that's quite an interesting story, who, who adopted me. And, 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 and it was very interesting. He had white fur and this, 
and brown fur this colour. And I thought, oh, maybe it was a monk in a past life or something. But anyway, he always wanted to come on the arms round with me. And it was really troublesome because, yeah, the other dogs didn't like him coming into their territory and then they'd attack him. And there would be all this bother. So that's why I ended up carrying the water, just protect him. <laughs> You know, and uh, but the sad thing was that, of course, because he's a stray dog, you know, he got bitten, and one time uh, it developed into a very serious infection. And I gave him, put some uh, betadine and things like that on. It wasn't betadine; it was another one, and um, he recovered. But then another time it happened, and he didn't recover, and you know, got fly blown, and then passed away at the kuti, actually. But I did say to him, please, please, don't get reborn as a dog. <laughs> but, then, but then about six months to, no, it may even be a year later, I'm going on the arms around, and then this dog I see, and it crouches down just like this dog that died, and the same colour, and then runs towards me like this dog used to, a bit like a sheep dog, really, the, the way they behave, actually. I thought, wow, no, got reborn. <laughs> So it's an interesting, interesting story. So, yeah, so that was how I defended myself. But using our wisdom, using um, a metta, uh, is the best for us. You have to really be in the be in the moment. If you can be in the moment and see what what's appropriate, what's possible, that's all we can do really. And then not try to harm other beings. Yeah. So I'd like to finish there because now 10:50. And uh, before we finish off, just to mention, please, uh, you're welcome to come for the lunch dana next door, and there will be an alms round. This is offering of rice uh, to the monks, myself and Ajahn Sadaro. And there are volunteers over there to show you how to do it. So uh, they have a, a procedure for doing it. So you're welcome to come over. Please do come over and uh, join in the alms round. Uh, it's a very um, enjoyable, it's enjoyable time and it's part of our coming together is sharing with each other after, after the lunch dana. And also at the end of the, uh, uh, the lunch, uh, we, when the monks finish, we ring a bell and then you're welcome to come and speak to us, you know, once you've finished your lunch and you're ready to come, yeah. All right. So for those who would like to, please, we can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. Just to finish off. Oh, can I get up? Oh. Arahang Samma Sambundo Bhagawa Unhang Bhagawantang Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammam Namasam Supati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sanko Sankam Namam Thank you. So.